More video from outside of Kyiv and the Ukrainian counteroffensive is working. It's starting to push back the Russians. War is all about momentum and it is now flipping towards the Ukrainian side. This is two very different wars. Out here in the east where the Russians have this area and the civilian population is ethnically Russian, so either agnostic or friendly towards the Russians, they're doing a lot better. From here west, all of these areas that the Russians uh, are listed as Russian control, the Russians have to deal with a very angry Ukrainian population that is helping the Ukrainian army, which is harassing all of their supply lines and making some of these counteroffensives possible. This is the area we're going to settle in on here in a minute, but it's so key because the NATO supply lines run right through it into Kyiv. Now we'll give you a zoom in on Kyiv to show you what the Ukrainians are doing. They're trying to push out here from Kyiv. They've now pushed out in some areas about 30 miles. This is that key highway that leads out to the west, into Poland, into the NATO supply lines. And the Ukrainians have basically been able to retake all this. They've also kicked the Russians out of some of the key high positions here that they were using to fire down onto Kyiv. And as you spend time on the internet listening and watching the battles by the Ukrainians against Russians in these areas, you notice something extraordinary about some of the soldiers. Take a listen. Got my man right there, my commander. He's got the USA patch on his shoulder. We got burning buildings. We got mortars. We got rockets. We got all the fun stuff to make it a beautiful day. There are a lot of Americans now fighting with the Ukrainians and bringing with them the experience of war in Afghanistan and also in Iraq. They're employing some of the same tactics against the Russians and the Russian supply lines up here and here that were employed against U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's a really remarkable flip of the playbook. The supply lines for the United States uh, coming out of Poland here through Lviv and then bringing these convoys down here and all the way out to the east. So far, the Russians have not been able to hit any of them, and the counteroffensives continue to keep the supply lines clear and open for the Ukrainians. The flip side is what is happening for the Russians. In most of these areas, their supply lines are getting cut and harassed. It's very difficult for them to bring anything in. It takes about 10 gallons of fuel to bring one gallon to the front line, and the Russians can't even get a couple of gallons, metaphorically, out to their troops. The one place that this is extraordinarily problematic for the Russians is in the south, because they were counting on the sea here to be able to bring in supplies. They learned the hard way here in this port between Mariupol and Meltopol that the Ukrainians have a whole lot better equipment and intelligence than the Russians really gave them credit for. This was a Russian resupply ship here in port. The Ukrainians hit it with a ballistic missile launched from up here. Video of that ship on fire. Another ship was damaged. A couple had to pull out of Port. So that really changes the ball game in terms of what the Russians are able to do. The Ukrainians are now going on the offensive. And right now, there is reports of shelling, both outside of Kharkiv, where the Ukrainians have pushed the Russians back, also cut their supply lines here, and then in and around Kyiv. It used to be, when you heard reports of shelling, you thought it was for sure the Russians. Now, oftentimes, it is the Ukrainians. With that, we bring in Lieutenant Colonel Dakota Wood, 20 years in the United States Marine, now a senior research fellow for defense programs at the Heritage uh, Foundation. Is there any way the Russians regain the momentum without figuring out how to resupply in a serious way that they haven't been able to figure out for a month? Yeah, no, they've lost the momentum. And what we'll see is an actual kind of stalemate, uh, although caveated with the points that you've been making, which have been excellent uh, as far as the Ukrainians going on the offensive. It's still an age old truism that you need a three to one advantage. Uh, if you're going to go on the attack against a defended or entrenched foe, if you're going to get involved in urban fighting, it's almost a 10 to 1 uh, advantage that you need just because it's so difficult you know, to uproot or to go against somebody who's solidly behind fortifications and protections. And clearly, this is the Ukrainians fighting for survival, whereas on the Russian side, they've been horrible at logistical support. Their efforts are not coordinated across 
across the country. They don't have any serious air to ground coordination where they're leveraging air power, especially during the day. And so a lot of these advantages then play into Ukraine's hands. And we're seeing the effect of that tactical prowess on the battlefield. Right. It's, I mean, the Ukrainians are, are taking advantage of what appears to be just sloppy um, military preparedness and a plan from the Russians. Um, Ukraine's Navy says they sank that large Russian landing ship um, that Leland just showed video of. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think we're going to be seeing more of this from the Ukrainians targeting um, all of those Russian ships out at sea? Yeah, you got to try to do everything that you can. So if you can use a missile or a rocket or a you know an anti-armor munition, if you could sneak somebody in close, you know, obviously that would be a tough uh, task. Uh, but all these options are on the table. Uh, hence, uh, President Zelensky is specifically asking for anti-ship missiles, and uh, NATO members are considering that request. You know, it would amp things up. But again, they're fighting for survival. So where the Russians have 10 or 12 amphibious ships in waiting, they've been using their surface fleet to bombard some of these uh, coastal cities. Uh, Ukraine has to have the ability to fight back. You know, they lost their navy when Russia took Crimea. Crimea and uh, and gathered all the ships that were in Sevastopol. So they really don't have any naval power, but you want shore-based or land-based anti-ship missiles to try to uh, destroy what Russia has there in the Black Sea. So all, all these options are on the table. The Ukrainians are using them masterfully. Uh, the Russians, very, very spotty performance. Their forces are thinned out way too much. Uh, from a tactical and operational perspective, and they've shown a lot of flaws in the execution of military plans, which tells us they've been lying to themselves, to themselves, uh, in all these massive exercises where you have scripted performance, reports back to Putin that we've got this locked in and we're all competent, but when you actually get into the battlefield, you find that the reality is much tougher than a scripted exercise. Mm. Uh, Russia says it's going to offer safe passage tomorrow of ships um, that are stranded in the Ukrainian ports. Um, this is worrisome, I think, for a lot of reasons. Do you think it'll happen? Oh, you don't trust anything the Russians are saying. You know, it's been reported that they have forced the uh, movement of upwards of 400,000 Ukrainians into Russia. Uh, probably taking them to camps of some type. Uh, they've repeatedly promised to open up humanitarian corridors out of Mariupol and other locations, and then that never happens. You know, shelling comes in, more civilians are damaged. So for them to say that they'll allow ships either in or out of those ports, uh, you know, the proof is going to be in the execution, whether they actually allow that to happen. But I am very, very skeptical, and the Russians give us no cause or no evidence to believe them in this matter either. What do you make of Ukrainians' ability to ambush and harass the Russians in their supply lines? We always make the caveat when we talk about these maps that the red areas uh, may be as far as the Russians have gone, but they don't own the entire battle space. You point out that they're not able uh, really to use their air force uh, successfully. Is there a scenario where the Ukrainians are actually able to push them back in a meaningful way? All right, well, take World War II, right, where everything was on the table, and set, yet still in France, you had partisans uh, because the Germans couldn't you know, control every square foot of France. So in this case, uh, the force levels on the Russian side are nowhere near what they would need to fully occupy and pacify Ukraine, whereas Ukrainians are living there. And they know the forests and the glens and the, you know, the river networks and all these sorts of things, goat paths. And, and as long as they keep up that resistance and the West, meaning NATO, the United States, continues to provide the munitions, they'll keep up this sort of fight. So the deeper in Russia gets to Ukraine, the more extended their lines of supply become, the more vulnerable those things are. And we're seeing the great effect Ukrainians are having on the war machine coming out of Russia. President Biden in the region, obviously at a really critical time, U.S. and NATO say they are working on contingency planning if Russia does deploy any non-conventional weaponry. Logistically, explain what that looks like. 
Well, you know, let's say that if we use Syria as an example, where the Russians or the Russians supporting the Syrians were using chlorine bombs, for lack of a better term, on civilian populations. If we use, saw that same tactic used in Ukraine, then it's going to be to the West and the NATO members of how do you respond, right? I mean, is it a quid pro quo kind of thing? Is it you know a measured response? Do you attack the airfield, perhaps? that the airplane that dropped that kind of munition flew out of, but that implies attacking Russian sovereign soil? Uh, do you try to uh, provide better weapons, S-300 missiles, to the Ukrainians so they can shoot these down? Or is it more diplomatic economic? You know, Do you fully isolate Russia? And your previous guest was talking about the problems of cutting off all energy flows when almost half of Europe's energy comes from Russia. So if you did that, it plunges the continent into a just to dramatic recession, job losses, et cetera. So it's going to be a real challenge that if Russia takes that step, what tools are available to the West and how deep do you want to get into this internal conflict there in Ukraine, possibly taking on combat action against, actions against Russian forces? Yeah, which at least so far the president has said um, they're not, right. wanting, not going to do. Uh, good to see you, Colonel Wood. We appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. God bless. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.